uh, of a series of American Children Elbows Surgeons Virtual Fellows Conference. This is a 16 week virtual program which we've initiated under the leadership of Dr. Bill Levine, our president. Tonight's, uh, tonight's session will be on the painful shoulder arthroplasty. We are very honored and pleased to introduce uh, our moderator is Dr. Jay Keener. He's the Chief of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery at Wash, at Wash U. Our, our panelists is illustri illustrious uh, President-elect Dr. Mark Frankel, uh, Dr. Butch Krishnan, and Dr. Lisa Gallitz. And with that brief introduction, please, uh, rec I'm gonna turn over the, uh, the podium or the talks to Dr. Keener. For the participants, please use the chat room. At the end of every case, um, Dr. Mazaka and I will be feeding the questions uh, to, to the panelists. So, Jay? Thank you, Ron John. And uh, I want to thank you and uh, Gus and Dr. Levine uh, for your efforts in organizing this. This is a great, uh, a great initiative. And uh, special thanks to Butch and Mark and Lisa for joining in. Um, I'm not sure how I got to be the moderator because all of those surgeons are very senior to me and much more skilled and experienced. Um, so uh, with that being said, we'll get started. So uh, this is our charge. Uh, Dr. Mazaka wants us to present cases, uh, cases that torture you in the office and what tortures you in the operating room. So today's theme is painful shoulder arthroplasty. This is a first case. Uh, this is a patient of mine seen recently, uh, uh, evidenced by the COVID mask. Uh, this is a 53-year-old gentleman with uh, right shoulder pain. He's had pain for about three months and uh, insidious onset, no trauma. I replaced his shoulder nine years ago at the age of 44, did an anatomic shoulder replacement, and he has been very, very happy. He has had a good result, uh, has had no problems, very functional, uh, right-hand dominant, works as a prison guard. Um, he complains of three months of pain uh, that's localized along the lateral chromium and radiates down the deltoid and um, it hurts at night. And that's, that's the symptom that typically brings patients into the hospital or into the doctor's office. Treatment to this point has included laser therapy from his chiropractor, which surprisingly didn't work, and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, on his exam, there's no visible cuff atrophy. Is AC joints non-tender. Um, he has pretty good motion, active elevation is 140 degrees. He's a little stiff with rotation, but it's about 30 degrees. He can reach behind his back only to the PSIS level, and that's painful. Um, on his uh, cuff strength testing, his abdominal compression test is negative. Um, he has pain and slight weakness with resisted external rotation and resisted abduction in Job's position. Um, so, uh, Lisa, uh, first question to you, how do you like to, to examine the cuff in an arthroplasty patient? Is there anything you do different? Um, well, like you said, I like to look and uh, see if they have any atrophy in the infraspinatus fossa. Um, also, what is going on with the deltoid is really important. Uh, with regards to the rotator cuff, of course, external rotation strength. Um, both at the side and in abduction. But what's really important after an arthroplasty is the subscapularis. That's part of our approach is to either do an osteotomy or a peel or a tenotomy, um, and that's debatable. So uh, after someone's had a surgery, it makes a big difference um, in why it could be painful and how you would approach it. So I'm, very, I'm pretty careful about looking at the subscap. Yeah, and uh, in, in your experience, how reliable are our traditional subscap tests after arthroplasty? You know, fairly. I think you can get a good idea of, uh, of you know, whether it's working or not. If it's, if it's really completely off for one reason or another, that's pretty obvious. Um, sometimes the subscapularis can heal in continuity, so it's not as strong as it was, but it's not completely torn. So I think a good exam is fairly reliable. You can get a sense of whether there's any function there at all or whether it's completely gone. Yeah, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, we would like things to be black and white, but as you mentioned with the subscap, sometimes um, you, you have healing and continuity and there's a little bit of weakness. My, my problem with the subscap test is a lot of the test positions that we put our patients in, they're too stiff to assume that position. So you, you get a lot of false positives 
with the traditional subscap uh, tests. Um, any other exam findings you're interested in, uh, Lisa, before we move on to the x-rays with this presentation? Um, any, any other exam findings? I think, again, you know, a good deltoid exam is really important too. You know, if someone's had surgery before, you always want to know uh, what's going on with that. Always do a neuro exam, look at the incision and see how that looks, if there's any sign of any infection. Yeah. What if he had pain along his medial scapula and a little bit in his forearm? Did that change anything? Yep, you always want to look at the cervical spine too and just make sure, you know, shoulder pain can cause neck pain, neck pain can cause shoulder pain. So uh, certainly, you know, it's been 10 years since you did his surgery, so there could be degenerative change in his cervical spine. So, yep. One of the things you taught me is that whenever the, uh, there's symptoms along the medial scapula, always uh, pay attention to the neck. Um, okay, uh, Lisa, these are his films. Uh, again, nine years post-op, anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty. Um, how's it looking to you? Well, I trained you, Jay, so I'm going to say that it's beautiful. No, <laughs> of course. Um, it looks, you know, on these views, and I know how you get those views, um, the, the joint space looks a little bit narrow, and on the axillary, it looks like he's riding a little bit posterior. Um, on my screen, I don't really see a lot of loosening uh, around this, that around the peg, uh, but it does look like it's riding a little bit posterior and it looks narrow on your AP. So, yeah, I agree. I, I think worried about some uh, uh, glenoid wear. Exactly, I agree completely. On the AP view, the the, the central peg actually is profiled very well. It looks pretty well ingrown, but there's a lot of joint space narrowing uh, superiorly and um, posteriorly. Uh, these were his preoperative films. Uh, Lisa, how would you, uh, for the residents and fellows, how would you classify this, uh, this uh, pattern of arthritis? Um, it looks like a B2 to me. Uh, so you can see, on, especially on the axillary view, that's a really good axillary view. He's, so he's riding posteriorly and he's made himself a little neoglenoid back there. So he's got some uh, pseudo subluxation and um, joints, you know, the riding posterior, which is interesting. This is it really illustrates an interesting point. So I always say, uh, the humeral head always want to go wants to go from whence it came. So when someone uh, rides posteriorly like this, it's this is a common thing. They continue to ride posteriorly. It's like they're they've had proprioceptive change. So even no matter what you do on the glenoid side, they, it always uh, you know this this happens where it's yeah. riding posteriorly. There's one X-ray. I'm going to move my yeah. Another, I think another important point is when you see a young person with a primary OA where it's end stage like this and there, you know, there's no inflammatory arthritis history, no previous instability surgery, um, a lot of these B2s present in, their, in younger people, their late 40s, early 50s, the joint wears out a little quicker. These are his one-year post-op films, Lisa. Do you think um, I recreated the anatomy pretty well and um, uh, what do you think about the centering there? Paul Sethi's texting me that I overstuffed the shoulder. Did I overstuff the shoulder? Um, no, I don't, I don't I, no, on that AP on the upper right hand side, you know, maybe you could have gone one size smaller, but uh, Paul, it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, you know, it, I think it's, it's a good estimation of the size. And um, remember that, you know, in a native shoulder too, you have cartilage that you don't see. Uh, so when you put a humeral head in there, you know, you're, you see everything there, whereas on a, on the native x-ray or a normal x-ray, you see the bone plus, you know, there's some cartilage there. So, um, but it looks, you know, but, but it is riding posteriorly. If you look at that axillary view and you look where your radiographic marker is, um, I think it looks like you did a good job, uh, reaming it flat, but, uh, you know, sometimes there's not much you can do about this. You can try soft tissue balancing and things, but this is, you know, something that this guy is going to be prone to just because yeah. of disease. If you look at his body habitus, um, those that, that's a tough glenoid exposure. And um, if I was going to critique this, I would say my glenoid implant might be a little anterior. And sometimes that's a little, sometimes that's the, the, the problem, the pitfall you run into on a beefy 
a middle-aged uh, patient. So, um, um, you know, maybe a little anterior. So how do you, uh, Lisa, looking at this uh, AP film here, how do you, if you're uh, educating residents, how do you judge if you've overstuffed somebody? What, do you, what landmarks are you looking for? So I really like to look at where the head is relative to the greater tuberosity because that tells you what the, what the head is in relation to the rotator cuff. And that's arguably the most important part of determining the size. So when I'm sizing a head um, in the OR, what's really, really important to me is where that head is in relation to the tuberosity. And I always think if it looks a little bit too low, uh, to your eyes, it looks perfect on the x-ray. So I always try and put that head, what looks like about two millimeters too low. And then I find that on the x-ray, I really like it, that where it is best. So uh, yeah. I think that's the most important relationship. Yeah, I think I, I agree. That's the thing that I key in on uh, intraoperatively is head height first and then trying to establish posterior coverage or recreate the anatomy. Um, the uh, other thing that's been described uh, out of a uh, Cleveland clinic is this perfect circle uh, concept where if you draw uh, a concentric circle at three points, one is the lateral uh, aspect, lateral cortex of the greater tuberosity, uh, one point at the junction of the head and the medial greater tuberosity, and then one point down at the cow car, um, that is your predicted uh, head center. And then you can, um, you can overlay a perfect circle on top of that of the actual head center you recreated to see how far off you are. So um, uh, that's in this case, uh, you would say maybe this is up two millimeters or so. So um, there's been some studies actually looking at how well we recreate the anatomy. Um, this is uh, looked at from the Cleveland group. Uh, we published a paper um, recently uh, looking at stemmed arthroplasty and we showed that uh, you know, probably 68% uh, of our humeral heads were greater than two millimeters. Um, only 29 were greater than three millimeters off of this center and uh, less than 15% were uh, more than four millimeters off. And was su surprisingly, this was very well tolerated. Uh, they, the center of rotation amongst these three categories um, really had no influence on any of the patient reported outcomes. So as long as you're not too egregious with, re with anatomy recreation, usually function is uh, fairly well preserved. These are a couple of cases uh, just to show in of what a clearly overstuffed uh, joint looks like uh, on the left, and then um, a case of a of a both of a proud humeral implant and an overstuffed uh, shoulder with a, a metal backed uh, glenoid on the right. So these are obvious case examples of uh, overstuffing, and this is a, a very minimalistic um, example. So back to our patient. Um, this uh, gentleman has what I believe to be cuffed base pain. I'm judging that off of the location of his pain, the fact that it hurts to reach behind his back, which is uh, something that Dr. Yamaguchi taught me is one of the most uh, sensitive tests for cuff inflammation, is painful loss of rotation behind the back. And he has some pain and weakness with resisted abduction. Um, Mark, this patient shows up in your clinic. Uh, are, you, are you gonna order any further imaging for him? So, Jay, you know, for me, this guy had a, a well-functioning arthroplasty for nine years. He obviously is large habitus, looks like he's a pretty active guy, and uh, radiographically, it looks like he's wearing his poly. And a couple of comments, you know, Joe uh, Iannotti uh, introduced the perfect circle, and what, he, what he's postulated is when you have, uh, like, posterior wear and you try to ream the high side, what you end up doing is you end up medializing the joint line a little bit. And as a result, we often will compensate with a slightly larger humeral head to, to slacken the soft tissue, which may have some implications of the wearing of the poly. That's just sort of an aside. So, so in my mind, I'm seeing this guy and I think, okay, I understand this guy's problem. I would probably not be so worried about his rotator cuff. I'd be thinking, he has progressive poly wear. He's eccentrically wearing his poly. He's getting a synovitis from his polyethylene wear. And initially, I would probably be wanting to not operate on this guy. I'd probably try to explain to him, like, look, you know, your shoulder's inflamed. You're wearing out your joint. 
let's try a period of rest, anti-inflammatories. Be patient because these inflammatory problems are often cyclic. You might have something that will flare your uh, inflammatory response. Um, I might get some uh, baseline labs, fed rate, C-reactive protein, because of the thought of they're elevated, they might be helpful if they're not. If I was going to follow him, I could use them as in serial testing. So I, I wouldn't be quite so quick to get any advanced imaging at this point, um, because I would be not thinking about wanting to reoperate on this guy just as of yet. Um, because, you know, if he's going to get a revision, my, my first question to patients about a revision of arthroplasty is, if you compare your shoulder function and your shoulder comfort to how you were before your index arthroplasty, if you tell me that you're still better than you were during your index arthroplasty, you're probably not ready to have a revision yet. Um, and my thinking about that is you need to be actually worse than you were before your index because the likelihood of the improvement you'll get won't be as likely to be as great of an improvement from the index arthroplasty. So you'd like to have them be a bit lower in terms of their starting subjective shoulder score, for example. Sure, okay. Um, it, uh, let's assume that uh, maybe his uh, changed the case a little bit. If his plain films looked pretty good, there was no excessive polywear, but you had clinical suspicion of a cuff exam, um, what, what is your preferred imaging in this case? Again, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to really want to image his cuff very much because if he has a torn rotator cuff, if his joint's centered, I'm not going to do anything surgically. If he has loss of uh, his registry of the humeral head to his glenoid, it's got to be profound to impact his function for me to then think about surgical treatment. So if he has a cuff tear in, in, a, in a total shoulder, for me, the only operative treatment that I'm going to do really is going to be convert to reverse and he has, he has to be, there has to be a threshold of pain and dysfunction for me to become sort of a, in that mindset. So I, I don't really uh, look at any imaging study. I don't really, I might do an aspiration again, thinking about an infection or a CT guided uh, aspiration, but I don't really try to get specific imaging to look at the cup. I don't find it helpful in my decision making. Sure, okay. So um, uh, Lisa, how do you uh, prefer to evaluate the cuff in this uh, setting if you were to choose so? Um, my, well, after an arthroplasty, I really like to use an ultrasound. Um, it's very hard to image a rotator cuff and get a reliable exam uh, with, with a humeral stem in place. Um, even after surgery, it's hard, but especially with, um, you know, with, with a stem in place, I, I just, uh, an MRI can be so deceptive. So I really like to use an ultrasound and that also is a good way to image the subscapularis. Uh, so that would be how I would, I would approach that. Okay. Um, so I ordered an ultrasound. Um, uh, we have ultrasound uh, readily available at WashU. Um, so um, I guess, you know, one of the, one of the discussion points is what's the preferred imaging? And, uh, and then the second thing, which Mark kind of segued into is what do you do with that information? I mean, is that clinically relevant? He brought up a good point. This patient, you know, some, some of these patients develop small tears, but don't lose their force couple. They don't have significant migration and they're well compensated. So are you really going to attempt a cuff repair in that setting? So he has a 12 by 11 full thickness, uh, millimeter full thickness cuff tear. His subscap is intact and he's got no atrophy of his posterior cuff. Um, so in my practice, this is not a real common presentation. You know, someone with a kind of a cuff exam following total shoulder arthroplasty. Um, I guess we could argue if how reliable is your exam on localizing the pain generator when there's some polywear. Uh, but uh, how often, uh, uh, Butch, how often do you see patients that you think have painful cuff disease after anatomic arthroplasty? You know, Jay, it's, it's a very interesting question because, you know, as I'm listening to Mark and Lisa and you talk about this, you know, so many thoughts go through my head that, uh, you know, I didn't think about 10 years ago. Because you know, I, I look at your implant, and I think you know, ten years ago, wow, that was a that would have been a, a great implant to put in. I would have been so proud of it. Now we've started to learn, like Mark was talking about, that we evaluate implants on a chronal oblique sequence or an AP, 
we don't really look on the axillary view as much for the sizing of the implant. And we're starting to realize more and more that, you know, probably we are oversizing the heads in that, in that plane. And then we evaluate our arthroplasties and everybody's great at one year, great at two years. But, uh, you know, as my mentor, Joe Walsh taught me, unless you get to 10 years, you can't really say that anybody's great. And so, you know, when we really started critically looking at these people, at least in our series at Baylor, our own, and then, you know, our tertiary referral, it's really that five-year mark that we start to see just changes. I mean, you'll see people come back for their five, seven, eight-year follow-up. They say, Doc, I'm doing great. But if you really critically evaluate them, you see they have cuff weakness. For me, really an external rotation test at the side, taking their own and testing it really helps me evaluate the function of the force couple of the infraspinatus and the subscap. Because I firmly agree that it's really difficult to do a lot of the maneuvers that we do with normal shoulders. But that simple test at the side and looking at the shoulder and watching to see if there's any shift or the deltoid, you can detect this, this little bit of cuff weakness. And if you really critically talk to these people between their five and 10 year mark, almost all of our anatomic totals will tell you, yeah, you know, I've lost a little bit of strength, but hey doc, you know, I'm getting older. I kind of like my shoulder. It's, it's probably okay. But it's in this younger group, you know, these people who are in their 30, late thirties, early forties who have an arthroplasty. This is the group that, hence the reason you brought this case up that come to us and as Mark said, you know, you have to have a value-based decision and a threshold to, to go forward with your investigation and then what are you gonna do with it? Because it's pretty binary for me. When someone has, is a young patient like this and has a cuff disease to anatomic total, I've only got one operation that I can do that I can reliably tell them will probably give them the best durable outcome. And the question is, do we wanna go there? So the question you asked me is how often do I see painful cuff disease? It probably sees me a whole lot more now because I'm paying attention to it beyond the five-year mark than I did before. Okay. And that's a great uh, response. And you brought up a lot of really uh, important points uh, that are uh, kind of uh, good knowledge for the residents and fellows. So late cuff failure is actually fairly common. And um, it... Uh, the thing that's really remarkable is it's often very well tolerated. As you stated, patients get older, they're lower demand. Uh, you may see proximal migration on a plain film, but their function is preserved and they're minimally painful. So the number one risk factor for developing a cuff tear after an anatomic arthroplasty, assuming the surgery was technically done well, is length of follow-up and you nailed it. So uh, the series out of uh, France, the multi-center series, uh, looked at proximal migration as a surrogate for cuff insufficiency. No problems at five years, 16% of shoulders at 10 years, and 55% and at 15 years had evidence of cuff disease. Um, and as I said, it's often very well tolerated. So uh, the other study that uh, is, uh, we should think about with assessing cuff is the CT arthrogram. So uh, MRI, as Lisa said, is um, not a, a great test because of all the metal, but the nice thing about a CT arthrogram is you can assess the cuff and you can look at glenoid loosening. Um, so this guy, 53 years old, very active, dominant arm. Uh, he has a full thickness cuff tear, and I'm gonna go down the panel, Butch, uh, those are your three treatment options. Are you going to non-op him and follow him? Are you going to offer him a cuff repair or are you going to revise to reverse? It's either going to be one or three and that depends exactly as Mark said on that value-based decision. If he's ready to go down the road and he's reasonable, you know, uh, Christian Gerber once said years ago, we don't know if these patients are going to outlive their implants, but Bob Buholtz who passed away, who was my, uh, my mentor said, uh, you know, he's going to do a total hip in someone who's 30 if they can get 10 years of good function. So if this man is ready to go down this road and understands the, the functional changes that may happen with the revision, I'll move to revise him to a reverse. But if not, you know, I'll, I'll ride this as long as we can. The one thing about riding it as long as you can is there are some subtle findings on your nine-year postoperative x-ray. There's a little bit of osteolysis at the supramedial corner of the humeral head. There were some shifting and changes in the humeral bone. You know, the, there comes a point where bone cannot tolerate a revision as well, and not necessarily in this case. So I think that needs to come into play. It's not just, hey, you know, go away and come back when you're ready. There might be some actual biologic factors that affect it. Uh, Mark, are you going to stick with non-op and follow-up? Yeah, and I think Butch's point, I, I've, uh, I think, is a really good one. I think as you lose glenoid bone stock, um, particularly, you, there, there's probably a threshold 
in which there's, you've just made uh, that person's reconstruction and their viable likelihood of a very good outcome significantly less. I just don't know what that threshold is. So I, again, I try to have engage in a patient about expectations so they understand that, you know, they might imagine that getting their revision is going to be much like their primary arthroplasty. And right. I want to make sure they understand that is an, a, a very unlikely scenario. Um, so they, they first have to understand that. And if they're really miserable and they're really dysfunctional, I would be on this guy because his function is pretty preserved. He has three months of shoulder pain. Um, I, I would be very reticent to suggest surgery at this point. I would try to really encourage him to sort of uh, maybe modify his life activities and, and try to find alternative methods of managing his pain for some period of time. But I, I wouldn't be eager to operate. And, you know, I, I might at some point consider an arthroscopic debridement on him first to evaluate what, how much, uh, whether it's going to raise loose and any other uh, findings. But I've done that very uncommonly. And I've not done a concurrent cuff repair in, in a, a shoulder arthroplasty in, in, I think, 30 years. Well, I guess in the 90s, I, I tried to repair the subscaps, but not for quite some time. I, I just would feel uncomfortable in letting him know that I thought that would be a predictable solution to his symptoms. OK. Lisa, uh, do you uh, any other thoughts? Um, no, I thought everybody uh, brought up really great points. But uh, given this patient and these x-rays and the history that you gave, I would lean toward non-operative treatment for now. And uh, just, a, just a quick, would, is there any scenario where, uh, where you all would repair a full thickness defect in the setting of a well-placed anatomic arthroplasty? So the, this is a patient that's young, so in theory may heal. Um, what your, do you have experience with doing cuff repairs after anatomic arthroplasty? Um, I, I really don't because I don't think that they heal very well. I think that the biologic um, environment, once you have that soft tissue kind of up against metal, like, uh, you know, maybe it will heal, but I, I think it doesn't, it, it's not like a normal rotator cuff repair. And there are so many other issues with an arthroplasty. I really don't have a lot of experience with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Jay, uh, Jay, hold on. We have some questions for you. Okay. Um, Question absolutely. is: uh, Is there a role to inject with cortisone after a total shoulder arthroplasty? I think uh, selectively. Um, it's a it's a little higher risk. Obviously, the implications of creating a Periprosthetic joint infection are are concerning. Um, um, if you saw that uh, um, that case that I presented, the, that patient had a band aid on his back of his shoulder. I gave him a subacromial injection, um, uh, just. Um, uh, but I would I would do those sparingly. Um, so I, I chose to rehab him and treat him non-operatively. I did give him a shot because of the night pain. Um, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules whether you can or cannot inject a pros uh, uh, the cuff around the prosthetic joint. Um, I obviously would not want to do an intraarticular injection, but that's kind of a, a you know gray hair. If you've got a full thickness cuff defect, you're actually getting some of that steroid in the joint. So, um, I mean, I will do it selectively, but uh, not repetitively. Another question was, uh, does a subscap tear versus supraspinatus tear change your management or decision-making for revision? And a caveat, does anyone worry about accelerated glenoid loosening in case of cuff, cuff tear, i.e. non-op management? Yeah, I, you, you definitely, uh, if, if you have a large enough tear where the infraspinatus is, is involved and you have external rotation weakness, as Butch mentioned, you're going to lose some of your force couple and probably have some proximal migration, which can lead to accelerated wear. I think the accelerated poly wear in this case was related to his B2 morphology. Um, so uh, that is a concern. Um, subscap's a different animal. Um, um, the only subscaps that I will revise now is something that I catch acutely uh, postoperatively, and there um, there is subluxation of the humeral head anteriorly. And if if you don't get to that relatively quick, it's really hard to salvage that. Um, um, fortunately, I have gone to move using a, a lesser tuberosity osteotomy, so I pick up on on early subscap failures a little better because I can see it radiographically now. Uh, but still, I mean, you 
that might be one, two cases a year, and it's usually uh, an early recognition. If you try to do it in a delayed fashion, you're not gonna be able to recenter the head, and it's an unsatisfying surgery going in there in a chronic situation and trying to tease out what is subscap and what is capsule and actually repair something. And when you say acute, what do you mean? Um, preferably the first six weeks, but uh, maybe up to three months, um, especially if it's a younger patient. But uh, a lot of the subscap failures that I see are second opinions of a painful total, and it's six months out. And uh, the, the only way you can salvage that, in my experience, is a reverse. Um, so there's not a lot of literature on fixing cuff tears after, um, posterior cuff tears after shoulder replacements. Um, this is the one series I could find out of Mayo, uh, 14 out of 18 failures. Um, so uh, those were, this was a longer term follow-up study, but uh, patients had poor elevation and uh, fairly high VAS pain scores. So it, I, I agree with Lisa, there's probably something different biologically uh, in uh, in the in the milieu of the shoulder after an arthroplasty that probably likes makes a cuff repair uh, less tenable um, I'm not saying that I haven't done it. I have uh, done it in younger patients, but uh, it's very hit or miss if it's successful um, So uh, if there's no if there's no other questions um, I think we might move on to the next case uh, Gus. Are we good to move on you think? Yeah, one other question for the panel. How often would you radiographically survey to detect loosening that would compromise bone stock. Uh, Butch, what do you think about that? Million dollar question. So the, uh, the guy goes away and he says, Jay, I don't want to do anything. Uh, you know, when should I come back and see you? Bone changes every three months. Give him a three month shot, bring him back, take a picture. If he doesn't change, say, give him a six month shot. Doesn't change, give him a one year shot. You know, I don't have any hard or fast answers. But I will tell you the one thing that, that bothers me more than surveilling via x-ray is surveilling his cuff. And you know, there's, it's a very subtle physical exam finding, but if you have the arm in a neutral position, just neutral, not the hertel full lag, but just a neutral position, keep the hand in the fist and you actually test the infraspinatus. When the cuff starts to become deficient in these anatomic totals, you'll start to see a little shift because the anterior deltoid starts to fire. It's very subtle. But pay attention to it. Just do it in your normal, for the fellows, your, your patients who have no arthroplasty, just normal cuffs, you're just learning how to do an exam. You're not going to see that same shift because the deltoid will actually compress. It's a very subtle shift of the humeral head. If they're a big patient, you may not see that. So, Great. All right, great. hedge the answer. <laughs> okay, um, Mark, uh, this is your case. Uh, you tell me when to advance the slide and I'll let you present. Uh -huh. The, the, after your case, this seems like it's going to be a little bit more complicated. So go ahead. So next slide, Jay. So this lady, uh, this is a uh, 2005 and she's painful. Uh, Lisa, oh. what were you going to do? It's 2005. So this was done 50, so the date of, an, of the original surgery was 2005? No, no, this is when she's presenting to me at two, at, in November 2005. I've okay. taken care of this lady for 15 years. Okay, this, well. This is the first time she comes in, she's miserable, she, her, she has poor shoulder function, she's very unhappy. Okay, so the reverse became FDA approved for use in the United States in 2004, thank goodness. So you had an option, but it was a relatively new procedure for you. So this is a really um, interesting example of sizing. Um, so looking at her AP view, the x-ray on the left. So we were talking in the last case about an overstuffed joint. This is the perfect example of overstuffing. So this looks like it might even be a centimeter to two centimeters high. So if you look so, at the top so of just Historically, Lisa, this is a bipolar. So Rick Worland had yeah. came out in uh, probably around the beginning of the, of the 2000s, early 2000s, with this novel design. And uh, as you know, that was early. Yeah. You know, reverses that not many other people were. And there were several alternative approaches to dealing with a cuff deficient shoulder. One was a CTA head, which this isn't, and the other one was this, which is a bipolar. Yeah. Uh, and 
this this didn't enjoy a good history of results and and this is why so it look uh, so it's high and it's also causing lateral offset so if you look at where the greater tuberosity is relative to the acromion and uh you know this is what happens the glenoid wear even in a cuff deficient shoulder because it's so up overstuffed it you just get really volumetric bone loss on the glenoid side so, so what are you going to do here lisa well, I think, you know, if she has a lot of pain and okay. cannot live with this, we're looking at a revision. Um, okay. So, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. So, yeah. tell me what you're going to do on the humeral side. Um, so, I always work up for infection, but... She's not infected. Yeah, she doesn't look infected. Um, right. And part of the reason, this is important too for the fellows, looking at this, you can pretty much bet that it's not infected. And part of it is you really don't have a lot of bone loss on the humeral side. And a lot of times with infection starts to cause osteolysis. So, um, so that's good. Anyway, so I would uh, plan to revise and do a reverse. Okay. So, um, I, you it's know. Really the humeral side I want you to tell me about. So what are your, what challenges do you foresee in, in this surgical procedure. Yeah, this is a cemented, a cemented arthroplasty. Um, so getting that out is gonna be a challenge. It's really well cemented too. I don't see a lot of lucency in between the bone cement interface, except for maybe a little bit proximal medially, but by and large, it's really pretty well cemented. It's kind of third generation cement technique. So there's a restrictor in there. So this so give me your steps of how you're going to remove this. Tell me how you stepwise will go about that. Okay. So get in there and take that head off. Okay. <laughs> and uh, th so there are a couple of ways. So, so the first thing you need to know is exactly what's in there and you need to make sure that you it's have a bioangular, it's a bio bioangular, the proximal one third is coated. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you have the instruments because most sets come with some type of insertion instruments and help, some help getting this out. So do so you typically first, use those extraction instruments that screw into the top of the implant? You know, that's a good question. I like to have it. Um, I don't think that you would be able to expact with that, but sometimes it's nice to hook something up proximally just to control the movement of it. So I like to have it just in case. Okay, um, so you're going to go through, so you, you'll have that available. Yep. So some of the other steps you're going to do so you can remove the Yeah, I like flexible osteotomes. Uh, there's a set called a Moreland set that has a whole set of flexible osteotomes and I would just start working circumferentially, staying right on that prosthesis to try to loosen so your um, first move is going to be, you take the head off, you, yep. do, you buff this your exposures. I assume you're going to do an extended release so you have no stiffness. You have this the humerus well presented in your field, right? Yep. Okay. And now you're going, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take your flexible osteotomes and start working along the prosthetic cement interface. Is that where you're going to be working? That is where I would work, yes. You start with the flexible osteotomes first. Yes. Okay. Butch, same approach? Uh, well, actually, no, I might differ a little bit. Uh, you and I have much the same experience. I was going to put my Franco glasses on, but I, I got to stare at this thing. Um, I, I hate this implant, and thank goodness it's no longer on the market uh, because that proximal coating and the cement that's going up into the tuberosity, this, is, this destroys the greater tuberosity. So for me to get this implant out absolutely requires an episiotomy. You know, I, I cannot get this implant out without an episiotomy to, to bivalve part of the humerus. Otherwise, I'm going to destroy the greater tuberosity. So for me, following Lisa's plan, I'll take the head off. For those fellows who've never seen this, basically the bipolar head gets stuck inside the bigger head. So you take the head off, and then I would immediately move to a one centimeter episiotomy right in the middle of the bicipital groove with a small quarter inch angulated oscillating saw. I take that saw all the way around the edges split down that vertical episiotomy with the flexible osteotome. If I can sneak a quarter inch osteotome that's straight behind the implant, not on the tuberosity side, then I can rotate the implant and take it out. Otherwise, if you try to vertically explant this, you're gonna blow the tuberosity apart. 
Okay, Jay, any other tricks, any other differences? So you're, you're gonna go right to a episiotomy about a centimeter. Lisa, you're gonna work from proximal using flexible osteotomes. And Jay, how about you? My normal algorithm would be to take a, a, a high-speed bird that's drill-shaped and use that to uh, score around the implant to debond it, but that's not going to work in this case because it's fully cemented. So I would do a long vertical episiotomy and have a low threshold to convert that to a full humeral window osteotomy in, uh, anteriorly. So as you guys are talking about removing the stem, um, I mean, at what point? So, Jay, you mentioned that you might do a large window. Um, at what point do you think that what you're going to do in stem extraction might alter how you're going to reimplant the next stem? Because that then becomes the next question. How are you going to reimplant your next stem? Lisa, why don't you tell me you got the stem out um, and tell me what are you going to do once the stem's out? Let's just say you lost part of the tuberosity. Um, I'm pretty sure I did, uh, but you have, you know, a good portion of the, the cylindrical portion of a tafaseal portion intact, and you still have cement left into uh, that area. What, what would you do then? So this is, um, uh, and I, I just want to say that for me, I try all those things first. So I, if I can't get it out and I, if, after I've gone circumferentially, then I would do the episiotomy and sometimes you get lucky. So, but you have to have all those things, you know, in your, in your, in your tool bag. Just, just, um, just one, one last thing before I go on. So when you guys start to uh, try the extraction maneuver to remove the stem, Lisa, you mentioned that you sometimes will use the inserter and start from the top up and try to hit it out. Uh, yeah. but you sort of said, well, I do some other way and, and, uh, Jay and Butch didn't specifically say where do they uh, where uh, Butch said he tries to twist it out but um, can you give me some specifics about where do you try to place the force to extract the stem? So sometimes so uh, one other trick that you can try is uh, to take a high-speed burr or a Midas Rex and you can actually drill into the prosthesis and make a little uh, a little inlet and then you can put a, a bone, like a big bone tamp, and then you can hit it retrograde. So you hit it from the bottom up? Yep. Okay, all right, so now I'll that it's out. try everything. Okay, so now okay. that it's out. Okay. What are you gonna do, there's, there's still cement within that. Okay, okay. so this is, this is where it's really important to know whether it's infected, because if, it, if it's infected, Separate then- Zero, this frozen section's negative. Okay. Okay, so I'm not too worried if I leave a little bit of cement in here. So uh, knowing that it's not infected. So I then try to get as much as I reasonably can, especially the cement that's a little bit loose on that, on that medial side, try to get out as much as I can. If I can't get it all out and I'm worried that I'm gonna penetrate the canal, um, then what I will do is cement within cement so okay. you need to know what size this is and what the sizes come of what you want to put in to make sure you have some space. Okay, so I'll come back to that specifically. Butch, how about you? Well, uh, you know, probably thinking along the same lines back at this time in 2005, I would have done the same thing, cement to cement, but we've had plenty of our own failures within one to two years of cementing to cement within the same actual tube. So the hip surgeons have taught us that if we're going to do that, we need to bypass by two canal diameters, distal to the tip of that stem. I can't really see on my x-ray if you've got a cement plug there, but personally, I actually drill past that, ream past that, and actually bypass by two canal diameters into as much normal bone as possible. In this day and age, you, now you we've smoking, you smoking dope over there? I'm not smoking dope. I got my glasses. You know, there you go. Okay, so right. Jay, I obviously took some offense to Butch's uh, method of saying that he's going to drill through where the distal cement is and through the plug, and like it's going to be an easy day in the OR. He's going to go get margaritas right after that. Jay, is he like, is that your experience in doing that? 
Well, there's no way for me to answer that without uh, without uh, <laughs> implicating somebody. I will tell you this: that um, um, I have we've had luck cementing within a cement mantle. So I don't think you need to go long. I will go long if I have to do a full window. That's the difference. If I have okay. to take. Fair enough. So that's why I asked you about your approach, that if you did a full window, you would now do a long stem, and would you cement that long stem? I would cement it. Okay. So just about experience, and we were supposed to quote the literature, we just published our series of 80 cement within cement, and we had an 8% failure on the humeral side, so it does happen. We did a fault mechanical study, and what I'll tell you we learned is you want to put in the biggest stem you can if you cement within cement. So go to the next slide. Um, so I'll show you the mistakes I made. I did not do that. See that? I cemented with the cement. This is what I did in 2005. Um, go ahead, uh, critique me, uh, Lisa, but beware. <laughs> well, so it looks, so it is small. Um, and again, medially, it's still, well, now actually it looks like there's a radiolucent line at your bone cement interface, both, you know, medially, laterally. I see it on all the x-rays. So. Okay. So what do you think? Um, you know, the first thing I think when I see loosening like this, this is an She's area. Okay. This is her first post -op, This is like first post-op x-ray. She's happy right now. She's happy right now? And yeah, this she just came back. We did her surgery in November. This is now December. Okay. I'm a little worried. Okay, you're worried because you see the radio loose in line. Yeah. And, and Butch, are you worried too? No, uh, I'm not worried because it's just a cement technique. It's a, it's a technique, it's a technical uh, factor. The only thing I'm worried about is there's no metaphyseal support. All the tuberosity is gone. So in my experience, that's a, that's a predictor of early uh, loosening of the humerus. Yeah, yeah, go to the next slide. You're a smart man, there it is. So now, now um, just so you know, John Levy was my fellow when that came in. Derek Cuff becomes my fellow now. So Derek <laughs> comes in and he sees this and he says, got to be infected. It's a year out, got to be infected. Okay, infection workup is negative and it turns out it was loose because, so which, is there anything other than the loss of bone that you think might have contributed to the loosening of the implant. I gave you one hint about the stem size. How about on the glenoid side? Is there something else on the glenoid side? Well, because it's a semi-constrained implant, I mean, the forces are different across the humerus. I mean, there's rotational forces across the humerus that are totally different from the compression into the glenoid. And, you know, the, uh, in this case, you know, I've lived this same, exact same nightmare. So, you know, I feel your pain. And so, thankfully, we understand part of it. So one of the issues that happens is when you lose humeral bone loss and you're trying to get soft tissue tension, you end up using larger mm -hmm. proximal humeral implants. So that's a larger humeral implant than I would typically use. And the glenosphere is somewhat larger. And by doing that, by now using larger implants to make up for the soft tissue tension, it, it led to, I think, contributed to this. So... Um, just for the interest of time, because this case goes on for some time, I'll show you what I did. You can go to the next case. So this is what I did. So this is now uh, 2006, I think. So what do you guys think? Well, you went, you used a proximal APC, um, uh, fixated with uh, overlapping uh, the lateral cortical bone, which is a nice technique. You've got a long stem, which is good. Um, I think the cement technique is not ideal. And uh, I think in retrospect, uh, you probably would choose a thicker uh, stem now. Okay. A anyone else? So okay. this is now 2005, um, and she's really happy. So next, next slide. So now it's 2012. What do you think? It's seven years later. Comments? Looks good. Oh, it looks yeah. good. Yeah. Can I start doing the hula dance? No. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> not, 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 for seven, for seven, yeah. not for seven to ten years, right? Because oh, that's... Oh, uh, that's right. Okay. okay, so next one. Okay, so now this is what... This is, uh, I think this is now uh, 18. So that's... Uh, wow. 
now, 12 years later, she now comes in and she's miserable. Okay, so uh, I'll start with you, Jay, since I've been going up and down. What, what's going on here? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it's this, uh, it looks to me like the graft is resorbed um, and uh, the stem is loose. You've got fragmentation and fracturing of your cement, uh, uh, profound radiolucency circumferentially. Uh, it's a loose stem. Um, uh, the graft resorption is a little bit unusual, uh, but you know what, as if grafts are fully incorporated, bulk allografts, they do tend to resorb and you had really good graft to host healing at your seven year x-ray. So uh, maybe the body kind of slowly resorbed this. So obviously you're concerned about, uh, you, you have a loose implant and you're, you know, this is very likely aseptic loosening, but you would want to think about infection workup here as well. Anyone else? I mean, that's, you know, we, we worked up for infection, but again, the, the, the message is, you know, they, there's a lot of torque on the humeral implant. And when you lose humeral bone stock, proximally, the torque is transmitted to the interface. And once the bone resorbed on the proximal portion of this, it was, uh, again, we, we didn't learn from using smaller implants. Again, if you're going to do this, you want to use bigger implants. And it's still, you know, it's easier to use smaller implants, but it certainly is a, a lesson learned. Um, what would you do at this point? So Lisa, what, what are you gonna do now? Um, is there a fracture there? I'm looking at the uh, humeral shaft about uh, four right, centimeters proximal. Well, right near the end of the graft, I think there's resorption and okay. there's some ectasia of the humerus. All right. Uh, so, I mean, there's just, there's just some, I think more bone loss that has occurred proximally. Yeah. So this, this is a really difficult situation because the, now you've got, you know, very thin cortices and very delicate bone. Um, this is, uh, this is a lot. How, so what is the length of this stem? And this do you have a long end? Yes, this is 175. Yeah. You know, Sometimes this this may seem crazy, but sometimes you know we, we have all heard people talk about you know if you uh, kind of swing and a miss you know we're we're put in what I'm getting at is now we're putting in shorter stems. Um, so you're gonna go go in take all this out and we have a different stem options now. So I think that you know you could. Um, I don't know. We, I know you don't use APCs very much anymore. At least I don't think so. So I'm guessing. I'm, not, I'm asking what I'm going to do. I want to know what you're going to do. Huh? What are you going to do? What am I, I going to do? Yeah, I know what I did. Yeah, I would. I would actually try and uh, do some impaction bone grafting and put something in shorter. It's still going to have to be a fairly long stem to get stability. Um, and I think you're gonna to have to still use some cement distally, but I would try and recreate some bone with kind of an impaction bone graft technique proximally. Have you had a lot of experience doing that? Um, more in the elbow than the shoulder, but. Okay, how about you, Butch? You know, the, the Anaking series, and I'm not throwing darts, taught us that in the proximal femur, these bulk allografts fail at seven to 10 years because of fixation of the graft host interface. And this is exactly my same experience when I tried to just wire. So I only have two options to fix this if I want to try for function. I've got to redo the APC and actually add some type of neutralization, either a plate on the outside, as Joaquin and you have described, step cutting the APC, but something to control the graftose interface. Or I have to move to a custom, you know, type of an endoprosthetic human reconstruction. The, so one that prob the one that probably has a better chance of function would be redoing an APC with, with the plate in this particular scenario because you have so much bone that's lost. Jay? I had this exact same case three years ago and I didn't know what to do with it and I emailed a bunch of people and Joaquin told me to do an APC and plate it um, to decrease the torsional forces, just as Butch mentioned. And I've done that seven or eight times now. I do it selectively when the distal bone is bad. So if I'm cementing into distal bone that's bad or has had several stems in it already, I want to decrease the torsional load with a plate. So I use a, a proximal humeral locking plate that's long and goes uh, lateral and I, and I bypass the stem 
and get at least seven or, or eight cortices distally? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you that I, uh, I did the technique where I did the onlay of the cortical strategy described uh, for some time, and I, I hate to say it, but Joaquin uh, uh, gave me some very good advice because it's all about a resisting torsion. And unfortunately, that fixation method, even though it looked like it had an incorporation, I don't think it provides the same degree of torsion. So now you can go to the next slide. So this is, this is really what we thought happened. This is our, our, our hypothesis uh, in recognizing of, of the mechanics of what happened and go ahead. So this is the case and you can see the graft is completely resorbed and uh, it's not very solid. It, it did require a little bit of work to remove it. I think this is a pretty short video, uh, but hopefully uh, it will illustrate this is my preferred way of taking things out, ending from the bottom up. And uh, so then we, you know, we took out all the scar and I think in a revision like this, it's very impressive to see how much scar there is. Uh, and particularly when the graph resorbs, you just, this is the unfun part of the operation, uh, but uh, this takes more time than anything else. So I think I upsized the sphere a little bit here to make up for some soft tissue loss. Um, again, I, if you saw the revision, I downsized. This is, I, I upsized again. Uh, again, I used another allograft so I can do soft tissue tensioning. I can repair my soft tissues. And uh, what I did here uh, is I put on a plate and, and above. So you can go to the next slide, Jay. And that's what it is now two years later. So comments, uh, again, uh, for me, uh, at least I still use allografts. I, I find them very helpful, especially with uh, large uh, deficiencies of bone, like in this case, because I help, it helps me get rotational stability. Uh, again, I upsize the stem here. That was the other thing I think I learned from doing these, that you get much more rotational stability if you upsize the diameter stem. I might have been able to go shorter. That, that was a reasonable thought, Lisa, but I felt like I could really get very good fixation uh, with this reconstruction. And two years later, this is still working pretty good. She's older now, she's I think 70, so hopefully this will last the duration. I think you've successfully scared all our fellows into becoming fit and ankle fellows now, Mark. <laughs> oh, I really, I thought this was a great case. Yeah. <laughs> this, this to me is an awesome case. So yeah, maybe it's definitely not an arthroscopic cuff. Yeah. This is awesome. Um, a lot of good teaching yeah. points here. Ron, John and Gus, any questions we should field from the audience? One question from the group was, would anyone stage this last operation um, as opposed to doing uh, in once in one procedure? Um, I, I, I guess if I was worried about an infection, I would put in a spacer, but you know, you're, it, you're stuck. I mean, it, there's so much bone loss here. This shoulder is going to be extraordinarily unstable unless you are able to link it to the, to the glenoid. That, that'd be my fear. And the other thing is, you know, it's a, it's the glenoid side looks really good. So, you know, you, you'd want to leave that in. Uh, so if you staged it, you'd have, you have the glenoid side, but no humeral side. And just for the for the earlier part of the case, you might consider staging earlier when there was more bone. But as Mark said, this is becomes an incredible functional disability of the patient to try to stage. It's basically like a flail extremity, and that is really really difficult to tolerate for a staged fashion. And with the last few minutes, uh, could the, the panel just discuss how they measure or assess? Uh, version or rotation of the humeral side in an APC? So, you know, I like to use, uh, when I put the implant in, it has a version rod in it, so I line it to the forearm. So getting the version of the implant is easy, getting the humerus, so I'll trial it together, and I'll try to make sure that the, the graft and the implant are at that correct version relative to the forearm access. That's how I do it. Lisa, any difference? Nope. Butch? I think, I, 
No, I do it the same way. I just put the boat, put it together and trial it together. I think the more challenging question, the more relevant question is how do you judge length? I mean, uh, most of, most systems have alignment rods. So getting the version where you want it is, is pretty reliable. So there are some tricks to judging length. Um, and, and Mark uh, had alluded to this. You can, you can trial the uh, implant uh, with a thin poly in place and actually pull on the elbow down to recreate soft tension. And then you mark on the trial exactly how, how much of the implant you need to cement above the native bone host. So there's some val it's really tricky to get the correct soft tissue tension. Um, uh, and then you can build up your poly from there. If so if you use that technique to get you in the ballpark on length, then you can adjust your poly accordingly. One other question for the group is that, would anyone consider using a tumor prosthesis instead of an AC, as opposed to an APC construct? Sure. Ranjan, I'll take that one because that's, uh, that's actually what I was talking about. Depending on how much bone is left distally, you can consider using some type of a custom endoprosthesis or tumor endoprosthesis. The problem is it's really related to how much bone is distal. If you have, in our experience, at least six centimeters of bone above the olecranon fossa, then you can reliably get enough fixation. And for me, that has to be press fit fixation because we've found that if you try to cement, for instance, there are some prostheses on the market that are cemented endoprostheses. Again, seven to 10 years, we see exactly what Mark showed, that there's a rotational force of that area. So I think it depends on the amount of bone. There's so much bone loss in this case that it becomes very difficult. I think it's really, that's a really good question because for me, more than the length of the distal bone is the quality of it. And if those, t those, those implants, um, the ones that are probably have the best longevity are press fits. So if you've got, almost all of these cases have really thin cortices distally, and I don't trust the press fit uh, fixation in those systems. So if I have a revision case like this and the distal bone is, is thin and wafer-like, and there's fragmentation. Um, I think I would prefer to use an APC and, 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 and buffer the forces with a plate. I mean, that gives you better time zero fixation and potentially better long-term fixation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It's, uh, our hour is up. Thank you for a robust discussion and two excellent cases teaching us pearls. Dr. Frankel, thank you very much about the surgical techniques and tips. Uh, I think everyone on the panel, as well as the participants, very much appreciate them. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everyone. That was fun. That was great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for a great evening of fun. <laughs> Sorry, Butch. I didn't mean to make fun of you. It's okay. I've got my glasses. I'm good. I can handle it. <laughs> All right. You, everybody stay safe and healthy. Yes. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to the ASCS. Yep. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.